Greetings, Presbyterian Church of Dover, members, friends, guests, those who are here, are here in person and those who are watching later online, welcome. This is by far the biggest crowd we've had since the pandemic began. And it's good to see everyone. And um, we got, uh, we're getting a little shaky on our safety protocols with some of our seating and such, but I have a couple of questions. Given the, the, um, the new CDC guidelines and uh, the governor saying next Saturday doing away with the mask mand mandates and such, um, ultimately session will be deciding what our protocols will be, but give them a little bit of help. I want to ask a couple of questions. Uh, first is, how many of you would be comfortable doing away with the mask mandates for everyone who's been fully vaccinated, if you raise your hand. That's uh, not everybody, but most everybody. What about the uh, doing away with the social distancing seating? Would you be comfortable doing away with that? Not quite as many, but okay, that's, uh, that's helpful. And like I said, session will will decide these matters. We'll probably be doing some emails uh, back and forth this week to, to discuss it, and we'll see what we have next uh, next Sunday. We'll we'll post it in the uh, um, email blast on Thursday. Whatever decision we might have next Sunday is Pentecost Sunday, the birthday of the church, and. Uh, we uh, encourage everybody to wear red. Red is the liturgical color for that day. It also symbolizes the Holy Spirit, which came upon the, those early believers on that Pentecost Sunday. Following our worship service uh, next Sunday, we're having our Garden Remembrance Memorial uh, church dedication out in our yard right over here. You'll see the uh, things that we will have built, we have built, they are built now, uh, representing those people who have died in Delaware from COVID. And uh, our, our bells of praise will be playing at the Monday service, not the Sunday service. The Sunday service is primarily for church members, but then again, on Monday, we're having a dedication service for the community. And you have at least, you should have two of these in, with your bulletin, the flyer we have. We're asking you to take these home and give them to a neighbor or a friend to invite them or to uh, go to where someplace where maybe you shop and ask if they might put it in their window or on their bulletin board or something so that we can get the word out about this public dedication. And then the memorial itself that will be going through near the end of July. So, what else? What other announcement? The, um, in two Sundays, we're having an open house for the library, uh, our church library. They, uh, Barb, where's, there's Barb and a Pat, there's Pat. They've been putting a lot of work into redoing the library and they want to show it off in two Sundays. So after the worship service, there'll be an open house up upstairs uh, at the library. And hopefully people will come and see what's, what's going on there. As I like to say at the beginning of each service, whoever you are, and wherever you are on your faith's journey, you are welcome here this day. And we pray that the transforming love of Jesus might touch your life today. We're going to pass the peace, but you will stay in your pews. We don't get, we don't get to go out and hug each other yet. Uh, evidently, uh, it, the, the, the end is in sight where we can get back to some of these things, but not yet. The... Uh, so I'm going to invite you to stand in just a second, and I'm going to say the peace of the Lord be with you, and you'll answer, and also with you. And then you can wave and pass the peace sign and whatever to those around you. So stand, and let's...
The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Let us pass the peace. those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of coffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither, and all that they do they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Please join me in the opening prayer. Our most precious and loving God, we gather once again to worship the risen Lord. We desire to be your people in this place and to live out our beliefs through faithful discipleship and witness. We ask that you touch our lives this day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
call to confession. The Lord, the Lord watches over our ways. Let us put our trust in God's grace and confess our sins. Please join me in the prayer of confession. O Christ, who prayed for us, died for us, and lives for us, you taught us that we belong to you, and your word is our truth. Forgive us, O Lord, when we live as if we belong only to ourselves. Forgive us, O Lord, when we foolishly think that power is the ultimate truth. Speak your words of peace to us this day and make our lives a testimony to your grace. For you are the source of life itself, and only in you can we truly live. Please join me in the assurance of pardon. We have an advocate with God, Jesus Christ, the righteous one who offered his life in love to save the world from sin. This is the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Let's pray. May the reading of your word sanctify us in the truth and bring us to perfect joy. Amen. The first reading today comes from 1 John chapter 5, verses 9 through 13. If we receive human testimony, the testimony of God is greater, for this is the testimony of God that he has testified to his Son. Those who believe in the Son of God have the testimony in their hearts. Those who do not believe in God have made him a liar by not believing in the testimony that God has given concerning his Son. And this is the testimony. God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
the second reading comes from John 17, verses 6 through 19. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one, as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them in your name that you have given me. I guarded them, and not one of them was lost, except the one destined to be lost, so that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I am coming to you, and I speak these things in this world, so that they may have my joy made complete in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I am asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, so that they also may be sanctified in truth. The word of the Lord. Had to get rid of these masks. Our third scripture lesson you might recognize because it was also our call to worship. Psalm 1. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers, but their delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. In all they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like chafe that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. This is the word of God for the people of God. God. When, I, when I read this psalm, and it's one of my favorites, I, um, I think of Robert Frost's poem, um, The Road Not Taken. And in this poem, he talks about being taking a walk in the woods, and he comes to a fork in the road or path, and, and one is, is well-traveled and well-worn, and, and the other one is overgrown and obviously less traveled. And the poem ends with these words. I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Psalm 1 is kind of like that. We, we come to this crossroad where we choose, do we follow the ways of God or do we follow the ways of sinners? And um, the, the, the one, the, the righteous path provides us life and the other path leads to destruction. The ones that choose life, that choose the way of God, they delight in the Lord. They delight in the law of the Lord. And on that, they meditate day and night. In other words, they, 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 they don't just read the Bible, but they, they, they soak in the Bible. How does the Bible apply to how I live? 
So they're not just mere hearers of the word, but they are doers of the word. And it's, it's about our relationship with God. How do we develop this relationship with God? Now, and the result is, they'll be like trees planted by streams of living water. In other words, they'll, have, they'll be rooted and, and strong, and they'll be near what they need for growth, the, the, the waters of life. But not so the sinners. They're like the chafe that the wind blows, and uh, they, they don't settle on anything, and they, find, they, they, um, they don't find life. So we're at that, that point, that point of decision. Which, road, which path will I take? The ways of the righteous or the ways of the sinner. You know, Jesus spoke of a similar type thing when he said, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is easy that leads to destruction, and there are many that take it. For the gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life, and there are few who find it. You know, we all come to these moments where we're at a crossroad. Which way will we go? There's, we gotta go one way or the other. As Christians, we, we, we believe that we, we come to that place where we decide whether we want to follow God or not follow God. Our first uh, John reading tells us about choosing the life that we find in Christ, that by believing we, we receive eternal life. This is a big decision. And, uh, and I suspect that most of us are here because we made that decision to follow Christ, to believe in Christ. And therefore, we have eternal life waiting for us. But these aren't the only crossroads we encounter as Christians. There are others that we come across and um, uh, we choose whether we'll meditate on God's word day or night, like the, first, the Psalm 1 mentioned. We, we choose whether we will pray or not. We choose each Sunday whether we'll get up and go to worship today or not. And sometimes we come to crossroads that require a major life-changing decision. Whatever way we choose is going to make a difference in the path our life will now take. You know, that may be uh, whether you go to college or not. What occupation do you plan on pursuing? Do you change jobs as you go along? Who will I marry? Will we have children? Where will we live? You can get the idea that these go on and on. Where will I retire? These choices determine directions in our lives. And I want to uh, share with you some choices that I've had to make, some of those crossroads I've gotten to, uh, to maybe give you an idea of how, how God works in our lives. One of the first major crossroads I encountered, and I may have shared bits of this with you before, pardon me if you've heard it, but bear with me. When I was in college, I was gonna spend a summer working with the Southern Baptist in doing youth camps. Well, two weeks before it was to start, the, everything collapsed and the, the camps were not going to happen. And the people that were running it were desperately trying to find jobs for those that they had said they would employ. And I remember receiving the phone call saying uh, that the camps were not going to happen, but we're trying to find you a job. And they start mentioning some of the possibilities. You know, working at a church in Orlando, Florida, or with youth, or working with one in Birmingham, Alabama, with youth, or and and he's kind of describing them. And in my head, I'm kind of going, "Yeah, that sounds good," or mm, "Okay." Uh, but he got the one, and he said, "A Christian Drug Rehabilitation House in Houston, Texas." And my mind said, "No, nope, not going to happen." Well, you can guess which one they had planned for me. And there I was at this crossroad. Will I say yes to this or no? 
Well, I certainly prayed about it, and I believe that God led me to go. And I spent a life-changing summer in Houston, Texas, among these drug addicts. And my easy answer, black and white Christianity took a beating and changed a lot of my theology. Changed the direction of my life. I went back to college that fall and the idea was, I think I'll go to seminary. I think I will work with troubled youth that are drug addicts. And I went to seminary with that idea. I wasn't going to be a pastor. And then comes the next crossroad. I made a faulty assumption. I believed that the troubled youth and the drug addicts were in the inner city. And they weren't in the suburbs of Chicago where my seminary was located. And so I entered into a year-long urban training program. I told you I didn't want to be a pastor, didn't I? <laughs> this urban training program, I worked at a church, and I was challenged to consider being a pastor. I resisted. You get an idea that maybe I gave in. <laughs> and while I'm on a roll of crossroads, let me share one more of how I became a PC USA pastor. After seminary, I wanted to do inner city work in a church. I wasn't affiliated with any denomination. And I was tired of Chicago renters. So I decided to pick my city. Having grown up in Georgia, I decided, oh, let's go to Atlanta. Nice city, I, a lot of need there, urban ministry. And I, I, I go there. Well, I have a difficult time finding a job since I'm not affiliated with any denomination. But I did find a church that I wanted to be a part of. And this is a long story, and I'm going to make it very short. In the midst of that, I had a very strong crisis of faith. Where was God calling me? Was it to do pastoral work or was it to do Christian social ministry? Well, I felt God saying, maybe the pastoral work you ought to look into. And so the church I was a part of was somewhat affiliated with the Presbyterian Church USA, but not fully at this point. But I decided to pursue ordination with the denomination because I knew, I knew that there were so many uh, things you had to go through that God could easily close the door if that isn't what I was supposed to do. Here I am. I made, I jumped through all the hoops and I'm here and I've been doing this for 31 years now, as an ordained pastor. But each one of those places, there was a decision that had to be made, a crossroad that, that would be life changing either way I took. And I'm sure that I could talk to each one of you and you could share a crossroad that changed your life. And it'd be interesting to hear those stories. We don't have time to do it today. But it would be interesting to hear them. Because I believe God is at work in our lives. Moving and shaping us, giving us direction, giving us options. In our gospel lesson, Jesus is praying for his disciples. This is a, taking place in the upper room, what was read, and it was Jesus praying for his followers. He knew he was 
going to die the next day. He knew that resurrection would follow, but he also knew that he would no longer, his time on earth working with his pastors or with his disciples was coming to an end. And so he is praying for them because they're going to be at a crossroad. Do they, do they do the work that Christ has called them to do, which is to take the good news of the gospel out to the world? Or will they go back to fishing and whatever they were doing before they met Jesus? And he's praying for them because he knows they need the prayer. Because he knows if they choose to follow him and to spread his message, it's going to lead to persecution. And for those disciples, it would leave, except for one, lead to a martyr's death. And so he prays. And I get out of this that we need to be praying when we come to these crossroads. Which way do we need to go? We need to be praying for our church. Because our church is at a crossroad right now. The Holy Cow surveys that many of you filled out, they revealed that one of our strengths is our spiritual vitality. And what it means by that is we put our faith into practice. We live out what we believe, and that's great. But it also said one of the weaknesses right now is we have very uh, low spiritual direction and spiritual, or low energy, low satisfaction right now. And part of that could be due to the pandemic, Part of that could be due to we're in an interim period. But I would also suggest to you that part of it is we don't have a good understanding of who we are and what we're called to do. We have a mission statement. But whenever I ask people, what is that mission statement? I've yet to have anyone be able to quote it to me. And the, and the people I've asked are the ones that are most involved in the church who should know it. How can we be driven by a mission statement if we don't know it? How can it give us energy and passion if we don't have an understanding of it? I like to tell people that the mission statement, or I, actually I prefer to call it a purpose statement, should fit on a t-shirt. You should be able to, to, uh, to know what it is. In Easton, where I last served, the, the uh, purpose statement was to live and love like Christ. Simple to, 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 to learn, memorize, a little more profound to live out. But it would stretch whoever you are and wherever you are on your faith's journey. How do I live and love like Christ? And we had five things that we would use to measure it. Are we doing, providing transformative worship? Do we have loving and caring relationships? Are we uh, uh, practicing or uh, giving opportunity for spiritual wholeness, Christian education? Is there a meaningful mission that's actually making a difference? And or do we have effective outreach? These are things that all churches should have. But we boiled it down to live in love like Christ. So we're at this crossroad now, an interim period of time, where we hope to have a new pastor at some point. But we have work to do to prepare for that. The... Um, Session voted uh, this past year that we would became, become a Matthew 25 church. And what that says is we want to, to uh, emphasize as part of our life as a church one of three, at least one of three areas, preferably all three, but revitalizing the church, bringing life and passion to the church, eradicating systemic poverty. How do we raise people up out of poverty, 
eradicating structural racism? How do we make sure that there's equality for all? And these are tough, hard things to do. And it's easy to say, we, we're a Matthew 25 church, it's a whole other thing to live it out. So in the coming weeks and months, session to begin, we'll begin with session, but we'll bring it to the congregation because we need your input and your buy-in, asking the question, who are we and what is God calling us to do? And how do we live that out where we're at? Jesus prayed for his disciples that they'd be ready when they came to that crossroad. We need to be praying for our church as we too are at this crossroad. Will we choose the easy path or the less traveled path? In the words of Robert Frost, I took the one less traveled by and that has made all the difference. May the same be said of us. Amen. As we move into our breath prayer, for those who maybe this is your first time back with us or your first time here, we prepare our hearts for prayer by doing a breath prayer. As we inhale, we, we will pray today, great is the Lord. When we exhale, we'll, we'll pray greatly to be praised. And we'll do this for a little while as we prepare our hearts for worship. Inhale, great is the Lord. Exhale, greatly to be praised. Gracious God, we recognize that there have been numerous crossroads that we have encountered that have directed the direction of our lives. And we know that there'll be more in the future. It's just part of life. So we pray and ask for wisdom when we come to these crossroads, that we might make our decisions based on our relationship with you. We want to especially pray for our church as we're at a crossroad. May we fully understand who we are and what you are calling us to do. We ask that you give our, our leaders wisdom as they discuss such matters. And we ask that you be with our congregation as, these, uh, as, as the congregation also discuss these matters. May we not seek the easy ways, but rather choose the ways of your kingdom and go wherever that might take us. We do lift up our memorial garden that will be set, set up during this coming week and ask that it might be a place of healing, reflection, and prayer for our community. May it be a light at the end of the COVID dark tunnel. <clears throat> we would also ask for wisdom as we determine when and how to return to to normal following this pandemic. May we make, maybe we make sure we, we take the safety precautions we need to do. We pray for India where the outbreak is so intense right now. Give them the help that is needed to stem what is happening there. We also pray for Israel and the Palestinians and the conflict happening there. And we pray for a ceasefire, but we also pray for peace. How sad it is that the ground that Jesus walked on has experienced so much turmoil. We would ask that you bring lasting peace to this troubled region. And then finally, we lift up our prayer list and ask that you be with those on the list and hear there in our prayers for them and their requests. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus and we offer up the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. together as a congregation. Will you stand for the benediction? Living in the love of Christ, be open to God calling you to a new ministry or a new work. Jesus Christ has already given us into the arms of a loving God. Therefore, go in the spirit of peace. Amen.
got lucky I got a hotel room for the winter. 